The title of this talk is Revisiting Lorentz Transformation Using Quaternions that I gave at the New England APS meeting uh, in the fall of 2019 in Warwick, Rhode Island. I can tell you there were exactly 33 people in the room. And I told those people to not worry about that word quaternions even if they really weren't familiar with it. Instead, I advised them to substitute the word complex number, and I presumed everybody in the room would actually know what a complex number was. The difference between a complex number and this quaternion thing is that instead of just having an I, there's an I, J, and a K, and because there's an I, J, and a K, you can actually get cross products. Now, in this particular talk, we will never use a cross product. So the fact that it exists hmm, shouldn't worry you. Just treat um, R as like all three of them kind of acting together as a social unit. So relativity, both special and general, is really about two people who look at the same thing and one person makes comments about what the other person is seeing. And those comments are very precise. So the first thing is that the measurements of the two observers are different. And one needs a transformation law to calculate exactly what those differences are. In special relativity, you use a Lorentz transformation. In general relativity, you transform along geodesics. Now, why do you do get these different values? Well, because that's the way nature works, but, but the key thing is that the two observers actually can agree upon something. Uh, that is an invariance principle is shared. In special relativity, it's the Lorentz invariant interval. And in general relativity, it's really the equivalence principle at play. Now, symmetries are all possible transformations that have the same invariance. And I hope that we will always be able to visualize what a symmetry is about, like the Lorentz group SO31. Uh, I don't think it's widely known, uh, but I don't think it's too hard to figure out. General relativity, uh, that's a different story. I really don't know yet how to visualize what's going on there. But at least I can dream about it. The, the take home message though is if you think about transformations and you think about invariance laws and you think about symmetry, you're really telling the same story in different ways about what goes on in nature. All right, to do any physics like at all, one needs a base space and an affine or tangent space. So the base space we're going to use is space-time. That tells you exactly when, where something is. Now, that's a necessary thing to know, but it's not enough to say, and what's going to happen next? <laughs> to know what happens next, you need a space that can tell you about the changes that are going on. And one of the most direct ones to use is energy momentum. And I had to have this slide because in 2005, I actually came up with a new approach to doing gravity. I'm not going to go into that subject today, but it's kind of frustrating to have what you think is a valid approach to gravity that's new, and you can't get people to think about it. And my observation from giving talks is that people go, well, okay and then they go about doing their own thing. And so I gave it as a homework problem uh, on a one sheet of paper. It was this sheet of paper, um, which is available to you, the viewer. And I should say, at the bottom it says, uh, s email solutions to me, sweetser at alum.mit.edu, $100 for the first answer, $50 for the second, $25 for the third, 12, six, three, two, one. Uh, nine and later, get a numbered and signed business card suitable for framing. So, as of this moment, no one has submitted an answer. 
So the hundred dollars is still available. Uh, I hope it won't be available forever. But uh, as I say, if you want to come up with your own personal gravity theory, uh, this homework will help you come up with your own. You know, and that's kind of should be kind of fun. Returning to my talk, uh, the the invariant of ruler relativity. This is the most simple form of relativity where there's rotations and no boosts. I think it can be understood by almost everyone. Uh, going back to the Egyptians, because they were looking at the same thing and they were located in the same different places, so their X measurement would be different from my X uh, measurement and Y's would be different. But if we squared them, then we would agree on the distance R there. And we are looking at exactly the same thing. So we've got our invariance. Well, what else do we need? We need our transformation law. And that was figured out in the 1840s by this guy named Rodriguez. And he said if you pre and post multiply by a unit quaternion, uh, and you got to throw in a conjugate there, uh, then you will be able to move along that uh, kind of uh, semicircle there and get to a new position where the squares will work out. And this is known to rocket scientists and game programmers, and that's like all they use them for. <laughs> I, I think they can be used more widely, but that it's kind of considered a one-trick pony. And there are lots of other ponies out there, so um, we give it this job and we move along. Now, the invariant of special relativity, which takes into account people who are moving at constant velocities, is really just ruler relativity and a teeny weeny fix needed for a moving observer. So for that moving girl, her measurement of R is not going to be the same as ours. We have to now use events instead of just uh, those points in space. And then our, the times are not going to be the same. But the square of time minus the square of the distance squared, that's going to be exactly the same. That's what's called the Lorentz invariant interval. And so the question comes up, can the Lorentz transformation law of special relativity be written using real value quaternions? So the first thing they did was they said, well, this unit quaternion, that would be like cosine squared and an I sine squared, because when you square those guys up, it'll, it'll work out um, to do the rotations. Well, maybe we should just put in hyperbolic uh, cosines and hyperbolic sines. And that failed. Uh, oh, in 1910. I mean, that's a long time ago. In 1911, somebody else found the same kind of failure. Oh, they didn't call it failure. Okay, they said, if my quaternion is now complex valued, which is, we've got the i, j, and k, which don't commute each with each other, but we'll add another i that does commute. Now, to my ear, that just sounds like somebody cheating. You know, the whole point of having these three is that they don't commute, and now you need some commuting, so you throw in a, a second i, and I, they're using the same letter, you know, and it, but it is widely accepted approach to use. I just wasn't happy with it because complex value quaternions are no longer a division algebra like the real and complex numbers, and so that makes them deeply different. So, in in nineteen uh, in two thousand ten. A hundred years to the day later, <laughs> I said, well, what if you put the two U's on one side? I mean, you've still got triple products. And what if you just sprinkle all types of uh, conjugate operators in here? What happens then? Well, you can take this boost along, um, uh, along X, because Y and Z are zero. And if you do that whole thing out, then you'll get gamma t minus gamma beta x as the new t prime. And gamma x minus gamma beta t as the new x prime. And y and z completely all unaltered. And that looks spot on like a boost along the x-axis. And so that's very nice. And 
just this year, uh, this uh, guy from Russia, uh, Karanov, contacted me and said, oh, I thought I was the only person to figure this out, but looks like you might have figured it out before me. And uh, we had some discussions. Uh, they were kind of awkward, to be honest. <laughs> Why would they be awkward? Because I leave that question mark there because he came to the conclusion, uh, along with two other people with PhDs in the field of physics, um, that yes, it does do the, the Lorentz boost, but no, it does not do a 3D rotation. Like, really? Okay. Um, I mean, I was thinking of this, well, I should say, I think of this now as just we just generalized Rodriguez, right? Isn't that all we did? It's like, no, 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 no. That's not what's going on here at all. Uh, think of the Lie algebra, SO31, for the Lie group, SO31, which is, uh, covers all the Lorentz transformations you can. Uh, the Lie algebra has six degrees of freedom. You write it in the matrix representation, and there are three slots for rotations. There are three slots for boosts. It's obvious you can do rotations without doing boosts, and you can do boosts without doing rotations. Your little expression there has a quaternion that has a norm of one. That means it has three degrees of freedom, and three degrees of freedom is not enough to represent something with six degrees of freedom. And I say, ergo, you're a moron. Now, no, none of these people called me a moron, officially. But in a certain sense, they were so frustrated by the fact that I had a one quaternion parameter expression that I claimed could do both boosts, which I agreed on, and rotations. It was like beneath them to have a discussion, and so we kind of didn't. Well, let me give you at least three reasons why they might not be correct. And the simplest one for me is a little bit of algebra. We are going to use a special member of SU2, and that is where the scalar is equal to zero, and so we have this three vector that has a normal one. And if you do that, then you can see that the second and third terms of that generalization of Rodriguez go away. They cancel. And so you have just Rodriguez in the end. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I win, don't I? Uh, as I say, if I had healthy discussions with them, I, I think I would win. But another way of t thinking about this is that um, we, we have both that base space, space-time, and we have energy momentum. And if you think of doing physics with those two spaces, well, in one case, we get to do the 3D rotations. That's when the U has uh, the scalar is zero. Um, and you have energy momentum, which n naturally has velocities in it. Um, and in, in our case, the, those velocities had to be, uh, sorry, the gammas had to be greater than one. And so the way I view it is there are three degrees of freedom in the base space of space time, and there are three degrees of freedom in the tangent space of energy momentum. And that makes six. So we're okay with saying that both rotations and boosts uh, can be used to do special relativity. Now you might say, well, yeah, there are three uh, velocities in, in space-time, because that's just ratios of time to x, y, and z, and, and then there are three uh, angles, but you can't make that, that six degrees of freedom in, in, in space-time. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, that you really need to think about both space-time and energy momentum and then you have enough space to cover uh, independently um, rotations and boosts. And the final argument I would say is just thinking about animations of these groups in space-time. Okay, so the time is going to have a beginning, a time in the middle, and a time at the end. And so let's first think about 
uh, the group SU2 all possible sorts of rotations. It starts at minus 1 at the origin, so just a dot right then and there. It grows into a sphere and it reaches the middle at time equals 0 and it's, it's a maximal size of a unit sphere and then it shrinks down, um, shrinks, shrinks, shrinks until it reaches time 1 and then any time after that it's, it's just completely gone. So all it is is like inflating a ball and then having it uh, deflate completely. So what about the Lorentz group? Well, if you think about uh, the light cone, what the light cone looks like, it goes, that, that extends out to like negative infinity with like a huge uh, sphere. Okay, so that's minus big in terms of time and it's got just about as big uh, a sphere and it keeps on shrinking as time goes on, and it actually reaches a minimum at time t equals zero. And of course it could be any size, it depends on what interval you were studying, but let's just say, let's just work with one. We like to work with, with one, and that's its minimum size. And, at, uh, and then when we say, well, where, where does it end? Uh, it never ends. <laughs> it gets as, as far out in the future as you want to go, it'll be a superly huge uh, ball uh, out there. And that's all well and good. But what you should notice is that now, the, at the middle, that the group SU2 will involve every same element uh, uh, event in space-time as SO3-1. I was kind of surprised when I realized, yeah, they, they share one moment in time which they must in order to have a nice clean space to do pure rotations. And so I would say the animations also argue that um, this Rodriguez generalization uh, can do pure rotations as well as boosts. All right, um, I should say that I ended up the, 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 the talk by handing out uh, these these homeworks uh, to all the people and, and I was the last talk so I had to like speed hand out and uh, as uh, I gave it to everybody and we will see in time whether anybody uh, supplies an answer or whether the homework was too hard or people don't like strangers giving them homework. <laughs> I mean, it's an experiment uh, and I will be interested to see what happens uh, because of it. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>